call the order of our board session. Goodyear City Council, December 3, 2007. Council members are in attendance. We have one item for our agenda, and that's on the staff response to the matrix report. Uh, subsequent to this meeting, we will go into our regular meeting uh, at the conclusion of this meeting, which may be very short, but that's how we'll plan the evening. And we'll start with the work session. Mr. Dolkey. And may I just intersperse one comment? That during this, if we would just, as your questions arise, you know, yeah, okay, is that all right? Um, yes, sir, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, that absolutely works well. And if we're going to be covering an item later, I may just um, ask you to table that until we get to that point in the presentation. Um, so uh, we want this as interactive as possible. Um, and absolutely, it's my pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, we, we have an opportunity to bring back the matrix implementation plan. Tonight we're going to talk about how we approached it and just as importantly where we go from here. Um, but I do want to just stop and, and really applaud the efforts of the mayor and council. This was a very comprehensive look at our city. This is a uh, an assessment that looked at efficiencies, effectiveness, structures, um, staffing, um, finances. It, it was a very comprehensive uh, approach to our city. And I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, we can hold it up and say that we are responding back to our citizens, our constituents, in a very positive way. So I, I put a lot of faith uh, in, in what has happened, and I look forward to talking about where we would like to take it from here tonight. The, um, the one thing I do, I also wanted to point out that as a, as a staff person, I think we're very fortunate to have um, council, for the mayor and council, for a variety of reasons. I mean, the vision that you've done with this um, progressive pro-development, pro-partnerships, progressive, and it made our job, I think, a lot easier as we approach this. And the other thing I'd like to point out is we as staff didn't really know what to expect when we heard that the matrix was coming toward us, we just didn't know what to expect. Um, was there apprehension? Maybe. Um, but I would uh, pub publicly acknowledge the mayor who took the time to visit with the departments um, in advance and talked about um, what the goal was for this study. And I think it, it put it in perspective and it really helped staff out understand. And I think the apprehensiveness certainly went away. Uh, as always, I do want to acknowledge just a couple of people before I jump into the meat of this, and that is uh, certainly the consultants that I'll, I'll introduce a little bit later uh, this evening, uh, but also Matt Hansen, and I don't think Matt's arrived back from California yet. He was taking a vacation with the family, but he was our project manager on this, and there were many iterations that, that went on with this, with this um, response. And Matt was there at the helms and really helping to coordinate. So I wanted to acknowledge him as our project manager. And his real job, he's our grants coordinator. Um, the other thing is certainly the deputies and the directors and staff and all those that just really worked hard on the response. Um, many, many, many hours that went into this. So uh, what we're going to do, we we'll jump into the next part. This is a timeline, and I'm not going to go through each of these. It, it looks like there's a lot of things that happened, and there were. You know, essentially, the matrix assessment, the consultants that came in that the mayor and council hired, that took about 11 months to go through their process. So that is a call order to spend that much time. And when they submitted the final report to council, um, our commitment to you was to respond back. And here we are a little over four months later with our response back. Tonight, and I want to be very clear with the approach that staff is taking on this, is we want open discussion. If there are items that may be perceived as policy um, or administration, everything in our minds is certainly open to discussion. So there aren't the lines there that uh, sometimes you may think about. So we'd ask that, that you, um, you look at that and consider that with any questions. The other is, is I'll be uh, one of the presenters. We'll have the consultants present. And any of those items that I would consider structural, um, as it affects departments and things like that, more structurally and organizationally, we'll have our deputies address that. So we will have uh, Deputy City Manager Jim Nichols and also Mark Brown that will say a few comments. <coughs> then as we get into the departmental side of things, 
uh, we peeled out of there or pulled out of the study a couple salient points. You know, 240 plus recommendations. No, we were not going to go through those tonight. We want to hit what we think are the key ones for each of the departments. If you have questions, we're going to invite our directors up here to give you more background. So we're all prepared, um, and we want to keep this as uh, open and interactive as possible. The other thing I want to point out is uh, we are in the process of hiring another city manager. The mayor and council are uh, in that process. Staff's expectation is, you know, we were tasked with putting together an implementation um, strategy plan, and we've done that. But we also know and recognize that the next manager for this organization will and should have input into this um, into this plan. So we look at it as living and breathing. We look at this as a chance for um, for us to keep looking at it. This isn't just a one-year fix. We think it's going to go out many years for us. So recognize that uh, we will work closely uh, with the city manager when they're on board to go through this. Any elements that they would like us to. After we were given this assignment, our first thought is, ow, <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a lot of work here. And what we did is we looked to really pull together some consultants to help us work directly with our directors and, and pour through the many details that were, were associated with this. So um, what we did is we retained PW Consulting. You can see their experience up there, 65 years of experience between the two. They've been introduced to council before, uh, but certainly without their um, input and efforts, um, it would have been very difficult to complete this in the time frame we did. So Mr. Paul Wenbert is the um, principal of PW Consulting. 30 years experience, 13 as a city manager, and he last had served as a deputy city manager in Mesa. The other consultant, his uh, uh, sidekick as we affectionately call him, is Lloyd Harrell, who has a little more tenure. He has 35 years of local government, but he has 30 years as a city manager. He is one of our um, Arizona City Managers Association range riders that goes in and helps communities out as well. And uh, he was last city manager for Chandler. So we had some great experience um, that helped us on that. So before I continue, I, I would ask that they uh, come up here, and they are going to step us through just real briefly the methodology that we went through. So uh, with that, thank you, and look forward to tonight. Thank you, Brian. Mayor and Council, uh, Paul Wenberg, and this is Lloyd Harrell. Um, before I get into our, our comments, which we will keep it very brief, just kind of go over the process that we used, I uh, did want to thank the staff. Um, you have a great city staff here. They were extremely cooperative. Uh, we needed a lot of information from them in a quick amount of time. Uh, they were responsive, professional, courteous, and it made our job a lot easier. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge all the staff that we worked with. Um, so first I want to cover real quickly the matrix study. Um, and I know that you all seen this. We were here in July when Matrix was here making the presentation to you. Uh, as Brian's already said, it took about 11 months to do it. Uh, extremely comprehensive. Uh, Lloyd and I talked about this quite a bit. We are really not aware of any other city that's tried to do something like this. Uh, typically, it's done more on a departmental basis. And so it's a little bit overwhelming when you see an assessment of your entire city government. Uh, so um, we applaud you for taking that uh, step. The matrix report was in two phases, and this got a little bit confusing, so I just want to kind of explain that. Uh, phase one was what they called the diagnostic phase, so it was kind of more general. And then phase two were their recommendations. So when we took a look at the report, which was 800 pages long, the matrix report, uh, phase two, there was a table uh, near the front of phase two where it listed about 180 recommendations. But then as Lloyd and I were going through phase one, it looked like there were some things that appeared to us, at least at first glance, to be recommendations, uh, but they weren't included in phase two. And so we decided to ask the staff to, uh, as they were answering our questions, to look at any phase one recommendations that were uh, significant that weren't carried forward in phase two. So the bottom line when you got done with the whole thing, uh, at the, the department heads brought forward uh, 60 items from phase one uh, in addition to the 180 from phase two, and so there were approximately 240 altogether. 
Uh, the next point, uh, again, this was in the matrix report itself. I just wanted to highlight some of the uh, positive and, and not so positive things in there. Um, in, in terms of positive findings, uh, it indicated that the staffing levels were appropriate in, in your city. Uh, secondly, it indicated that uh, you were providing average to above average service levels in, across the board, which is, is pretty amazing uh, given the fact that your staffing levels were only uh, at more the average. In some cases, they said below average levels. And then uh, thirdly, they had applauded uh, your staff for being innovative and coming up with new service delivery methods. And then fourthly, and this is, I shouldn't use the word negative, it's not really negative, but it's certainly a challenge, and it, it hit us right away, and that's the IT issues, the information technology issues. It were, there were so many, so broad, so major, from the most critical, replacing your financial system. Uh, it's every finance director's uh, nightmare. And um, that's one of the things in there. And it just goes on and on. Every department was affected one way or another by all of your IT needs, um, which we think is really just kind of a symptom of being a community that's growing so quickly. A lot of times your administrative infrastructure just doesn't keep pace. And, and that's what Matrix noted and, and what Lloyd and I certainly noted when we uh, looked at the IT issues you're facing. Okay, next, our methodology. What we decided to do up front was because there's so many different recommendations and there could be uh, a loss in communication, we thought the best thing to do was ask the department directors and their staff to give us answers in writing. So it would uh, reduce the amount of uh, potential uh, communication uh, loss that would occur. So um, as I mentioned, we asked them every phase two recommendation. We need uh, your written response to the questions that Lloyd and I came up with. And secondly, we wanted them to look at the phase one recommendations that they thought were still significant enough to carry over uh, into phase two and get, get their responses to that. And these are the questions, what you see up there, are the questions that we asked them uh, for all of their areas to give us responses to. And just real quickly, does your apartment, the department agree or disagree? And if you're disagreeing, what's your rationale? Uh, has the recommendation been implemented? Uh, if if not, when will it be implemented? What's the financial impact? And who's going to be responsible for implementing it? So we gave them those questions, and then Lloyd and I uh, took the departments and divided them roughly in half. And Lloyd took half, I took half. And we, after we got their responses back, we went and met with the department directors. And in most cases, it involved several other staff members, too. So we had meetings, and in many cases, it resulted in second meetings, uh, oftentimes a lot of phone calls for clarification of information. But we just tried to, we wanted those questions answered in a way that made sense to us and that we thought would make sense to the general public. Uh, and so that's what we kind of uh, prodded the departments over a couple months to, to get that information. We then put that in a draft form and met with Brian and the deputy managers and reviewed our findings. Um, and then from that, you see your final report. Okay, so finally, getting to the report, just real quickly want to um, kind of take you through it. There's uh, four sections in the front, which are introductory sections. Uh, you have the introduction and study methodology, executive summary, and a couple organizational charts. Then next, um, there are um, 16 sections with department implementation plans, one for each department. And then you have appendices in the back. What I want to do before, the last thing I want to do is go over the, um, the report format because um, this could lead to confusion if you don't understand um, how each of the things in the table are defined. So I want to just run through that real quickly. The first column, uh, and what I'm talking about is the actual recommendations themselves that you can see in any department uh, section of the report. Okay, so the first column is the report recommendation number. That's simply the number that we assigned to it. The reason we did that in the matrix report, there's a lot of different numbers and, you know, 5.3-2 and so forth. So we thought, well, we got to get that consolidated so we know which recommendation we're talking about. So all we did was just create uh, a number for that uh, recommendation, and then we gave a brief summary, like a two- or three-word summary, so you could just quickly see what that subject matter was. Then item two, that's the uh, matrix recommendation and page number. Okay, that is the exact wording from the matrix report, either from phase one or phase two. And so what we did is just basically copied the uh, matrix recommendation and put it in that column. Uh, the next um, 
the concurrence with the matrix recommendation. That's just simply uh, what is the staff agreeing with the recommendation or not agreeing. Um, the next, uh, the cost to implement. Uh, and this one gets a little tricky from the standpoint that we determined that the, your current budget, the 0708 budget, would be your baseline. So if you were going to be able to implement this recommendation within your current budget, we, we said that that was none. So if you see the word none, that means that it can be implemented within the current budget. Or if it's going forward to future years, it means uh, whatever would be your baseline budget for 0708 carried forward to a future year with inflation. So if you don't see a cost, or if the cost says none, that just means it's included within your base budget in simple terms. Uh, next, um, the staff responsible for implementation. That's pretty straightforward. And the one other thing that isn't on the slide I want to point out, if there's NA, NA in the column, that means that that uh, recommendation, it's not, that particular column is not applicable to that recommendation. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, the appendices, just real quickly, are uh, the first one is all the IT recommendations. The reason we did that is because there's so many of them and it's so complex. We thought it'd be helpful for you if you had them all in one area. And then the staff actually developed the next two appendices um, dealing with uh, the schedule for implementation and the cost of the recommendations. So with that, I'd like to turn it back to Brian and Lloyd, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Sure. Yeah. Could I ask you a question at this point? In, in your interviews, your original interviews, did you find it might be some inconsistency if you had some departments where more than just the chair of the department responded, whether that chair responded alone or whether that chair asked for other members of the department to respond with them? Would, would that cause some inconsistencies in your mind? Uh, generally, that was related to the size of the department. Um, I'll just give you some examples. Uh, the city attorney is a small department. I just met with the city attorney, and uh, you know that seemed to suffice. Uh, public works is a large department, so in that case, I met with three people, and I think they probably relied on other people to help them because it. So it really had to do more with the size of the department. Um, you know, I don't see any consistency. It would just be a reflection of your department. Well, I just if that is something that might cause some inconsistency in your data that you acquired to begin? Well, the goal that Lloyd and I had was to uh, push the departments and to get a consistent report. And when we and we would talk okay. quite a bit about, okay, I'm hearing this in this department and go back and forth until we could get, hopefully what we feel anyway, is, is a consistent report for you. Okay, thank you. In your opening remarks, you, you kind of made a comment disagreeing with uh, the structuring by uh, matrix uh, regarding I, I, IT. What are your reservations about their, their recommendation? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I just was uh, uh, be, be, uh, I was not uh, happy with my choice of words of saying it was negative. Um, I just meant that the IT issues were challenges. It wasn't a reflection on the IT department. Oh, and we okay. and no, we think the matrix recommendations, by and large, are were were good. I just it was the wrong choice of words on my part. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. The other thing before we uh, continue is where we're going, and I, I didn't point it out on the schedule tonight, December 3rd is a course work session, interactive. Uh, but December 10th, next Monday, what we plan on doing is bringing this back before council. And we would ask that there be an acceptance of the uh, implementation plan. Now, what that means is you can accept it in whole or you can accept it with exceptions. So, um, staff, here's some concerns we have. Will you please take those out? Um, of the uh, implementation plan at this point, and you can look at them in more detail later. Uh, but we think it's very important to bring this back before council get acceptance. Quite frankly, there are a lot of things that we need to be doing, and uh, we're a little bit in limbo on some of the things. Not um, overwhelmingly so, but by getting acceptance, we can just push on and get things going. So as you look at this and, and consider the things we're bringing forward, if you have concerns and those things um, move on over to next Monday night, and you want to say just take those out, we can certainly do that. Defer, look at them a little longer. The key findings, 241 recommendations from phase one, phase two. 
And the matrix consultants, when they met with the council in July, they said, generally expect about 85% of these are going to be um, doable, acceptable. And in their words, even some of their recommendations can be considered in conflict. So they had no expectation that 100% would be um, uh, implementable, if, if that is a word. Uh, but what we did do is we were very pleased with the results. Uh, we didn't look at a number we had to achieve, but we ended up at um, 95% agreement. Now, some of those are with slight modifications, and we'll talk about those. Uh, but it's a big number uh, out of 241, certainly. 42 of those recommendations, we have a pretty eager staff, and they've been working on, on some of the low-hanging fruit, if you will, and that 17% of those have already been implemented, or 42. Uh, additional 58 that will be implemented next year, and, um, and we think that's a big number. Uh, just generally, and I'm going to bring out a couple of specifics as far as what's already implemented, and that is, for example, agenda manager. Huge time saver. That's done. Um, so we're pleased with that. The others are um, uh, splitting up the current and long-range planning functions and community development. That's been accomplished with the uh, hiring of the second planning manager. Um, developing a vehicle replacement plan, that's been implemented. And then uh, the other last one I point out as an example is field reporting for police officers, having laptops in the field. Huge time saver for officers, and, uh, and that's already been done. Those that will be implemented by the end of the fiscal year, just a couple to point out. We're doing a class and compensation study, um, so we will have that done likely in February um, with total implementation next fiscal year. Uh, public Works inventory of building assets. A lot of inventory out there, uh, and we will be getting that done. And finally, um, citywide performance measures program. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but we think that it's very important to have performance-based management at this city. And, um, and we will have phase one implementation of that by the end of the fiscal year. Brian, on that chart, uh, sure. I think the one thing can be very uh, confusing and easily misunderstood. 229 of 241 recommendations agreed with by staff. You, you have a column, and you agree, you defer, you modify, you disagree. Actually, the 229 were, I believe, agreed modify and defer. Agree, modify, or defer, that's correct. Right, and uh, so, but using the word agreed can lead to confusion because that's one of the words used in evaluating whether how much you concurred with the report. And in fact, you didn't fully agree on 229. But right. What, but what you did, 12 of the 241 you disagreed with. That's right? correct. Yeah. That's correct. So I'll, it I'll just seems to me, if you're going to agree that, you should say agreed, uh, deferred, or modified. Okay. And, and we can certainly. That's, that's the term that you used in the column. But did, for, did, did defer mean disagree? It didn't. It just said. Uh, there's defer there's means we agree with it, but we need to move it out. It's not implementable it um, immediately it's without not us not doing more study. That's why we had it as agree. If it is a, uh, um, if it's confusing, we can certainly address that. The other is uh, agreeing with some of the recommendations where it needed modifications to fit um, our particulars. Um, we we agree in principle, um, but there's some tweaks to that. But uh, any of those, we can certainly pull out and um, do that in more detail. Key findings, and one of the things just want to be very clear about uh, in, in terms of the staffing estimates, this isn't in whole total. Um, this is what we know today. Um, we have 33 full-time positions that are going to be um, uh, recommended out of this, two part-time positions, two internships. And most of those are tied to really three areas, parts and rec department, um, consolidating the capital improvement plan, and then adding um, a total of eight management assistants over the next four years, two per year. Uh, that was um, uh, suggested by, well, we'll get into that in a little more detail, but that's primarily where those staffing numbers are. What it doesn't get into is if you look at um, impact of police staffing formula, uh, that is something we're not sure yet. Uh, we're looking certainly at, uh, at what those numbers will be. So also don't want to mislead and say the only, this is the only amount of um, folks that are going to be needed to be hired because uh, we will have positions down the road, obviously, as well.
terms of costs, and again, these have been identified so far. One-time costs, uh, so those would not be staff. That would be um, uh, not any ongoing expenses, but we're looking at uh, $4.2 million that's in, been identified now, and I'll talk uh, about the exception um, here in a second. And we break it up by the three different fiscal years of what those dollar amounts are for. Um, what it does not include is there are some very heavy items that are in the capital improvement plan that we felt would really skew the results of the financial implications. But we know that there are public safety facilities that are going to be required and the police staffing formula. So um, be sure that there will be additional dollars that will be hitting this. Um, and then also we have not um, in, in um, uh, we have not had a chance to finish our entire financial assessment of those things. So these are what are identified today, and that's what uh, the numbers we're looking at. So those are one time. The ongoing, which that's hiring staff, uh, a couple things there. We're looking at $3.5 million. That's phased in over three years. And uh, I think it's important to point out that over half of the recommendations do not uh, require funding to implement. So they're more process-oriented. Um, or things that we can just um, uh, work out without adding additional resources to. The implementation budget that we were giving, we have in this budget year $1.5 million in, uh, uh, to implement matrix. Where we're at right now is of that, we had 500000 It was really a set-aside to begin the enterprise system. Um, so that's part of that $1.5 million. Uh, of that, we and you can see we spent uh, really a handful of dollars at this point um, on ITS. We've also re uh, reserved 155,000 for ITS infrastructure. That's connection of buildings and those types of things. Um, and we spent some of that to date really to help uh, uh, connect our buildings. And the uh, and then the other is the consulting services of the folks that are working with us on this. So what that is is that's 814,000 remaining. Keep in mind, though, that we got another 500,000 and another 155,000 has not been that, that are uh, more for IT as part of that. We are not looking and coming back before council for any <coughs> what I call mid-year staff requests. Um, those would be ongoing, and we're looking at only one-time expenses that we're going to be using that, that those dollars for at this point. Major recommendations. Um, I'm going to have Mr. Nichols talk about this, and uh, and Mark Brown will follow him on the next slide, and I'll be back up here. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, <clears throat> there are three structural uh, recommendations in the matrix report that specifically affect or relate to some of the departments that I manage, and so uh, I wanted to go through um, our response to those recommendations and, and as well as our thoughts. Um, the first one was the possibility of merging the engineering and public works uh, departments. Part of the reason given by Matrix was that uh, a single director over both functions would enhance uh, the relationships between two related services. Uh, it would provide a unity of command. Uh, it would provide more efficient use of support staff. And it would push the accountability for departmental issues uh, down to the director level. Um, at this point, we don't believe that this is the, the best course of action, the merging of these two departments, because though at times they do have related functions, um, bottom line is that they're, um, the services they provide are still very, very different. Public Works is essentially responsible for the operation and maintenance <laughs> of our city infrastructure. Engineering provides inspection, permit review, design review, uh, of CIP, uh, Capital Improvement Program projects, as well as private development projects. Certainly they do touch from time to time and they do have to have a, uh, an effective working relationship, but the, the relationship is still tangential and, and at this point we believe it's best to keep the two departments um, separate. Uh, it would also be difficult uh, if you were to unify the two departments just due to the, the size um, you would, in essence, uh, create a single department of, of over about 120 people. And as you increase that, uh, that management oversight, the, um, uh, the, operate, or the, the management uh, uh, headaches can, can grow with that size. So keeping them at two, 
and I'll say mid-sized apartments is what we believe is the more, more appropriate course of action right now. Another one of the recommendations was that of moving uh, the aquatics and recreation functions out of public works and into community services. Uh, some of the reasons given by Matrix for that is that <clears throat> both departments provide uh, programs related to the quality of life for our citizens. Um, there is a mutual benefit to planning and programming through a single department. Uh, volunteers, which are currently handled by community services, are key to the success of both departments. And a community services approach to a wide range of programs is common in some municipalities. Again, this is uh, a recommendation that uh, we don't believe is the best course at this time. And again, even maybe more dramatically than I presented with the public works and engineering example, the functions between both the aquatic and recreations um, divisions as well as the community services department are very different. Aquatics and recreation deal with league sports, special interest classes, and special events. Community services work with code enforcement, neighborhood outreach, volunteer recruitment, and public art. And though community services does host our GAIN event annually, um, special events and programs are not really their main focus. That is one big highlight, but certainly you couldn't call that one of their main functions uh, within the city. Um, in addition, the, the ability to find a single director who would have expertise in these broad, diverse areas would become even more challenging if you were to include the aquatics and recreations element under community services, which is already a very diverse department. And finally, though volunteers are certainly key to the success of both departments, uh, we've really tried to make our volunteer program a, a citywide uh, initiative. It's one where uh, our volunteer coordinator in community services provides volunteer outreach and connections for all the departments in the city. So we were really wouldn't want them to focus just on volunteers for community service and aquatics and recreation programs. We want to continue to maintain that as a citywide initiative. Instead, what we're suggesting uh, through this process is the creation of a standalone department, a parks and recreation department. All of those functions would be uh, taken from public works and set into, uh, into a standalone group. Um, the department would include three divisions. It will, uh, those would be parks maintenance, aquatics and recreations, and then stadium operations. These three functions are uh, related and allow the sharing of resources, even though operation maintenance certainly is different than leagues and, and uh, programs. Uh, the need for the O&M side to work and coordinate with the events, with the event hosts, with uh, um, all the events that, and leagues that will be going on in the city, it's such a close working relationship that keeping them together, we believe, is, is the most prudent. And finally, on that issue with the, the ballpark coming online soon, um, we believe having that as a division under Park and Rec will continue to maintain it as a, an important highlight in the city as opposed to it being um, somewhat diluted amongst other divisions that have very different functions and focus within the city. The last recommendation that I'll talk to you about is the consolidation of the capital improvement program uh, project management function in engineering. Matrix notes uh, the need for the CIP consolidation to create accountability for the city's uh, CIP functions and it will improve the oversight of the program under a single director rather than several. Uh, <clears throat> staff agrees with consolidating CIP project management. Uh, and uh, we have developed a three-year plan, which is outlined in the uh, response report, that provides for the transition of CIP uh, completely into the engineering department. Staff would be added over time, uh, slowly as budget allows and, and as, uh, as council approval um, is granted and then the development of the CIP itself would remain in the, the DCM's office to ensure the objective development of the annual CIP instead of it being related to any one particular department it would, it would remain outside that to uh, to maintain that objectivity that we've uh, developed up to this point. That concludes my presentation on the structural elements uh, brought out in matrix that relate to my departments. If you don't have any questions, then uh, uh, 
Mark Brown will be the next one to present. Okay. I have a question for you, Jim. Uh, I think it was Brian Snow. You said, I believe, that merging engineering and public works would amount to 120 bodies in one yes. directory. Is that public works after you remove uh, parks and rec? No, that's before. So, in other words, it's really not 120 because you're, you're going to do the second bullet or the sec or the sub bullet, one of the two, and therefore you're removing parks and rec from public works. Potentially, but that hasn't been approved. So, but those are the two options, really. How many, how many employees to Jim's point? How many employees are comprised in parks and rec? About 20. Okay, about 20 individuals right now. So, it would still lead to a. Uh, if assuming that we are allowed to create a standalone park and rec department, it would still lead to a department of 100 individuals, approximately. Now, I have a question on community services. Uh, with code enforcement being in community services, isn't that contrary to what you just established as the philosophy of what community services is? Um, shouldn't that, does that fit when you? When some of the other things do not, yet you put code enforcement, we still keep code enforcement in community services. Um, should that be looked at as being moved maybe into police or we've, an we've, enforcement department? We've talked about that and, and actually explored that on a staff level, even outside the matrix process. The reason we really haven't pursued it uh, either removing code enforcement and putting it anywhere else, else police or otherwise, is, is twofold. We really believe that uh, the code enforcement and neighborhood services have a, have a very close relationship. Um, issues in a neighborhood can certainly um, help to be addressed by both the code side and the neighborhood services side. And then also, we have an internal philosophy that we're trying not to make code enforcement as um, uh, enforcement related and more into compliance relations. So uh, the thought was if we keep it out of police and keep it in the, the, its department as it stands right now, it'll continue to maintain more of a compliance focus rather than an enforcement focus. But then that, now you're leaning over into parks and recreation because you want to go into the neighborhood where mostly that's parks. Uh, I mean, that has a lot to do with parks and recreation, um, and yet we want to keep that as a separate. See, these there seems to be tie-overs in all these. I mean, the, the relationships from one department to the other, that uh, where they could stand to be moved or stand alone, maybe. But I don't know. Just just a thought. It just sounds like it doesn't as a rationale for keeping them where they are. It doesn't. Uh, really hold as far as I'm concerned. Just a thought. You know, just since these are the these were a couple of the major recommendations, uh, I, I was just wondering like merging engineering and public works is a is a significant substantive change in how we do business. Correct. And uh, moving aquatics and rec to community service is at, at least innovative. And I, I don't know that others do that around here. Uh, and then consolidating capital approval. As I understood it, when I read your response, you're agreeing that CIP goes to engineering, but you want to retain some capability at the head, right, at the DCM level? Just the or, yes. Or DCM or CM level. Correct. So, so you're pretty close on that one. Yes. But I just wanted to ask counsel, uh, you know, these two, first two are biggie. They're, they're a changing the way we do business significantly and I'm not sure that even if you agreed with them you wouldn't implement them until sometime after the first of the year and maybe even further downstream. It would, t it would take years to implement probably. Uh, it's probably. It seems to me worthwhile to defer these until we get this new city manager in here and let him maybe travel to California and have Matrix explain the rationale for the recommendations. Uh, but. These are so significant, I just, I'm hesitant to just write them off as it's, uh, not viable at this time because they very well could be. And a, a new uh, 
viewpoint on that provided by a city manager with a lot of experience in different part of the country, whoever it is, might provide value to us. So I don't see the rush on those biggies. So. No, but it would be nice to incorporate before we say agree, defer, whatever, say defer until we get this fellow in here. I can go with that. But, but, yeah. I, but they do make, a, make some very good points uh, in keeping them separate. Because as we grow, engineering is going to grow with this community. There's no question about it. And as we grow, they're going to have to have additional employees. And they're going to be have professional employees to report directly to the chief engineer. So, yeah, it, it's something to, to really think about. And you're absolutely right. I think we should leave this uh, for the new city manager coming on board to have some input in deciding what, just exactly what recommendations should be made to the council to divert from what we're currently doing. Thank you. Mayor, can I respond? Yes. The only <clears throat> the only time sensitivity to this, because I certainly understand the logic of wanting to defer. Um, the longer we defer, the longer public works has to remain somewhat, I'll say, in limbo because there are positions they cannot fill not knowing where their department is going. And they've been without a one of their deputy directors for five months now because you can't bring on another deputy without knowing what their position will be. And if you don't know whether you will be a department or a division, we wouldn't feel right making an offer to someone and we don't expect anyone would be willing to accept a position with that kind of instability in, in what their position would hold. So it's not just a matter of the pay range, it's also a matter of what will my title be. Someone may come here for a promotion and then turn around and if the department is folded into another one, suddenly their promotion becomes a demotion from what they may have left at a previous organization. So. I, by no means am I trying to rush the process, but I, I just at least want to let you know the, the consequences to, to the deferral because we're, we've been in a, at a holding pattern for quite some time. Well, you know, the, the mayor makes a very good point uh, about bringing on this, this problem or, or the issue, okay, to the, the new city manager, okay. And we're not talking about years, okay, for implementation. I think this is going to come about quite, quite, quite uh, expediently uh, once he gets on board and uh, certainly the council will work with uh, he and, and you to bring this to a resolution uh, but I, I think to rush into it Jim uh, I think would be foolhardy at this particular point yeah, I can expand on the, mayor, the mayor's comment. And if, if y'all look at page 61 of staff's response, I'm sorry, did you hear what you're if y'all look at page 61 of staff's response, and I, because that's what I'm referencing here, is and Jim, you talked about, or in the in the response, there's there's six points that public works is responsible for, and then there's six points that engineering. Uh, is responsible for in terms of design and implementation of the CIP. And I, and I think if I remember correctly from our very focused meetings with Matrix, that one of the challenges they saw, and I'd have to look at the Matrix report again to, to, remember, you know, to refer to that, was the challenge between project management of the design and construction of all facilities, as you've noted here, community and regional planning of um, the transportation network, or the, you know, the, 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 the very fundamental things that engineering is going to be responsible for in the CIP and there was this disconnect between what was maybe being planned or this communication gap between the very facilities CIP was going to be doing versus having control over the O&M of those facilities, over the, uh, the true estimated costs of those facilities and that sort of thing. So it was like, if I can put words in matrix, matrix, matrices mouth, I guess it's what the matrix is. <laughs> anyway. You know, if I could put words in their mouth, I, I think it was, you know, there was this, we, we developed the CIP and then we, you know, we, for lack of a better term, we birthed the baby, but we don't raise it, you know, and it was, that, that was what, what was, do you recall that kind of conversation going on in the sense that it was really fundamentally focused around that and it wasn't that public works wasn't doing the job, it was more they were responsible, as you stated, just now for the facilities within the city in terms of some of the 
you know, some of the stuff that they that is identified here. You know, existing, you know, roadways and areas within the city rights of way, um, city fleet vehicles and equipment. You know, the garbage and recycling collection. You know, some of that stuff. I, I got the sense if I from our discussion. I can't recall from the written document, but from our discussion, that it was really related to that interaction between those two. So, I, I, I mean. You know, long, long-winded, not unusual for me, but um, you know, I tend to agree. I, I don't, I don't know that I want to throw the recommendation away because I think there's some parts of this that you know, really, if you're going to build it or you're going to plan it, you got to own it and you got to, you know, you got to work it through. I, and I think that so maybe. You're I'm, I'm agreeing with I'm agreeing with the mayor here, but it, but I, I, it like, yeah, process, it wasn't so necessarily you know, abolish it. Abolishing no way. one over the other, no. it was, or taking responsibility away from one another. It was really that coordinated, that coordinated effort. I'm a, I'm a, wor I'm a bit worried about throwing the recommendation out based, based on, based on that. To the point of 100 employees, we're 55,000 and growing. We're going to have, I mean, fire right now is probably getting close if they haven't approached that already. It seem to function. So, I mean, eventually, eventually, management structure is going to grow. We're going to have. We're going to have divisions within the city. Numbers are going to be numbers. Yeah, be numbers don't mean so. But you weren't talking about throwing it out. You were just talking no. about let's just set it aside for a while so we have an opportunity well, no, they, to No, no, no. staff's disagreeing with the recommendation. Right. And they're not only disagreeing with it. I, you know, another thing, too, Jim, uh, is, and I understand your point on Cato wants to fill his billets, no question. Uh, but, you know, we're talking about a new person coming in. And we're talking leadership here, really. And we need that person to know that we trust them to take the reins of this city. And we're trusting them by leaving important decisions into his, his hands. Uh, and what we're also saying is you better be innovative and you better be creative. So I, I think the message here is a good message. Yeah, we want them to be in. Yeah, I think it's, we send a good message by doing this. Yes, we do. I guess the, the two departments really don't work in concert with each other sometimes. Well, but public works does as a function of engineering initially, yeah. you know, a lot of it. I don't think so. I think they function well together. It's, I don't it's think the that's... handoff of the project, it sounds like. To me. Well, it sounded to me like it was, it was the accountability structure, you know, there's... Accountability in which way? In terms of it funneled up through the same same function and the, you know the CIP wasn't saying go off and do this and it made absolutely no sense in terms of an O&M standpoint and O&M was going off and doing something you know the other way around I, it just it seemed like there was that communication and, and if I may comment that's a, that's a very fair observation um, I think part of the reason for that is that at the time when Matrix first started and, and did their report we had a brand new CIP manager we had a brand new engineering director, all of whom were, you know, learning their roles, learning their functions. Um, CIPs come a long way, engineering's come a long way, um, and by no means is this meant to sound like I'm not accepting the idea to defer. I, I understand your point and, and support that completely. Um, my only other comment on the, the any communication disconnects that may exist are that that's why both departments are under the same DCM. That, that's my responsibility to ensure when there is a disconnect, that I bring it together and, and address those issues. And, and that's a role that I'm still willing to uh, to maintain. But I do understand the need to allow the future new city manager to, to make the final call on this. Yeah, because in industry, of course, we, I guess we, I don't know if we can compare it to industry or not, but um, public works being that which is, they would call maintenance uh, and engineering are really totally two different things um, and you know this there's too many things here along with the parks and rec and everything else that um, I, I would just like to see us table this some way for the to defer. defer to defer it with that uh, if there are no other questions then uh, interim deputy city manager Mark Brown will come up now Evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, two main recommendations, major recommendations from uh, the departments that I oversee. 
Uh, first being public safety facilities, uh, the main headquarters, if you will. We talked, uh, you had a presentation from Durant Architects uh, a little over a year ago that talked about the needs analysis and the space needs and those kinds of things in looking at this. Uh, it also talked to in, in the matrix report about the court and having um, no place to store records and those types of things are being stored in offices and having secure places for them to be stored. Um, in looking at all of that as a campus, you know, the staff does recommend that, that we move forward and I'm happy to report that those projects are identified in the current CIP. Um, the second one being the citywide training facility. Um, Matrix uh, recommended that we seek a permanent training facility here. And again, that would encompass not only police and fire, but all city departments. And again, I'm happy to report that that is identified as well in the current CIP. Wait, wait I'm sorry. Um, yes. The 160 million, is that what we're talking about? Not, not that particular dollar amount is identified. And that is over a 10-year period. The CIP covers a five-year period, and those costs are reflected in the current CIP. Right. Okay. For the, so the sixty million to begin with. Phase correct. One. Correct. Okay. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. um, any questions on facilities? Okay. Uh, the second one, and it's probably the bigger of the issues, is the uh, uh, ITS issues. And uh, the first one, and very near and dear to a lot of the people in this room, and that is the replacement of our current enterprise system, more commonly known as HTE. Um, there are some steps and, and, and significant steps that need to happen before something like that can happen. Uh, one is we need a comprehensive business analysis to kind of tell us which, where we need to go with that and decide what type of users we're going to have and what is that enterprise system, that core system, going to encompass. Uh, we also need to do a request for proposal for procurement and implementation of that new enterprise system. Uh, definitely a long-term plan for the maintenance and support of that. Oftentimes those are the things that are forgotten about. We look at the initial purchase alone, but what is that ongoing cost of those systems? You know, we have uh, staff time, we have uh, other costs that go along with that. We need to, to know and, and understand how long this is going to be useful to us and what that's going to cost to maintain that all the time. There are also some other considerations that need to be given. One is, uh, will this shared data with some of the newly implemented standalone business applications that we have in the city. Some departments have already moved away from HTE because uh, of problems. Do me a favor now, if, if you're going to ask that question. What you have impl implemented into the police department, how can this be dovetailed to any new system that comes that comes into being? Like, uh, doing away with, say, HTE, how can we mold the current police computer system that you have without throwing it out? Right, and, and we wouldn't be looking at throwing it out. The connectivity would be the, the question on how we would do that. Right. Um, and, it and can be safe. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. And, and, and that's what we would want to do. We would look at what we have out there as far as applications like the New World Systems in the police department okay. and see how that can, can be integrated into that other system. And those can be done. But we need to have the plan to look at all of the systems we have in the city to make certain that we can do that. And, and then there are various ways in which to accomplish that. And the HTE system would have the connectivity with other cities. The the enterprise system? Yeah. Not well, necessarily. The new one? Uh, not, yeah, not, the new one. not necessarily. Okay. What we would look at with that is we look at the core business services that we do. And typically, when we're talking about enterprise systems, we're talking about uh, the human resources component and the financial component, because those kind of transcend all the departments. Okay. So we would need those as the core and look at what other core services uh, or softwares applications that we would, we, we would apply to that. But as far as connecting to other cities, um, that wouldn't be the, probably the main goal, and I'm going to defer to, no? No, it would not. Okay. Um, so, and, and, and later on in, in the presentation, there, there may be an opportunity for our new ITS director, Kathy Fernandez, to come up and talk and, and a little here's more. And another situation where we have a new director of IT that, that we've just brought in that's going to have to really get involved in how we can coordinate these. Absolutely. With, with every department. Well, it's going to take time. Absolutely. And, and, and she's been here 
almost 60 days now, and uh, yes, this was a lot of this was, or all of this was done prior to her arrival, and so we have looked at a lot of these things, and I'm I'm speaking from notes that she gave me today, so uh, just know that she is she is well aware of, of these things. So you're you're standing up there, and what is he talking about? He's chief of police. I mean, oh, <laughs> yes. You wore two hats. He wanted to say that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, and. Uh, uh, what we also need to develop uh, that go along with this disaster recovery uh, procedures and plans. Right now, w the data is one of the most important things we have in the city, and we need to protect that data. Uh, not only from disaster recovery, should something happen, and that could be uh, a myriad of things, we need to make sure that we have the plans and the backups there so that we can recover our data. And another one is, is the security practices in the city. We need to make sure that those are well known by everybody and that we're implementing sound security practices because, again, that, that data that's on those systems is vitally important to this, us as a city. Um, that is all I have right now. Are there any questions about what we've covered? Thank you left out. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, Mayor, members of the council, I, I'm going to hit a couple of the major recommendations that affect the office of the city manager. So I'll be addressing those. And then after we're done with this portion, then we're going to get into the um, uh, going to say details of the department, but again, at a high level. At that point, we will have um, Kathy Fernandez assisting us with some of the IT input. Um, so she will be uh, talking to you in a few minutes. The two items that, that we have in front of us that I, I, I felt that I wanted to pull out and talk about tonight, and certainly any of them we can, but two in particular, the structure of the Office of the Mayor and Council. In the final report for Matrix, it was talked about, let's defer that to the next city manager. Um, and we were we agreed with that recommendation, and then uh, about two weeks ago, we felt that there was um, uh, uh, management received direction on coming up with alternatives, at least to bring back before the mayor and council, in looking at the different types of structures that are out there. Um, and certainly, we were prepared to do that. Um, and let me tell you how we had planned to do that, and that is two things. One is is we want to do what I call benchmark, and that's look around the Arizona. Uh, may even outside of Arizona, to look at the different structures that are out there. Because the key thing is, is each and every one of our, our um, elected officials needs support. And it's the best way, can we, how can we best provide that support? Um, so we, we understand the importance of it. But there are different ways you can, you can set that up. So what we would be bringing back to you is um, different structures that are done at different cities. We would look at potentially um, what would work with us if we end up doing a hybrid. Um, we would be looking at the size of the cities, the amount of um, population that they have, amount of employees, and really try and do an apples to apples as closely as possible. At the end of the day, a decision uh, may need to be made to, to go a different route. Um, but that being said, we will bring back alternatives. We will have that back for council in January. Along with that, we, we look at it two ways, two-pronged approach to it, and that is, is one is of structure, and the other is, is what I call organizational effectiveness. And we need to, um, quite frankly, survey the, the mayor and council members as far as how best, what is it you need, um, and, and really survey to look at the, uh, what you see as the effectiveness, the needs um, of, of the service that you get. So that was our approach to that. We will have that done um, probably latter part of this calendar year, and we're looking at bringing that before council in January. That was the first of the items. Um, and the second item, and there may be discussion, that's okay. The second item is the one that spans a control. Matrix was very specific on reducing the number of direct reports to the, that the city manager had. And the reason is, and, and quite frankly, it was to free the manager up for a variety of, uh, for some very specific things. One is to work more closely with the mayor and council. The other is to work more, more closely with the community. And when you think about the um, uh, community, it's a variety of things that, uh, that that they may be involved in, everything from Westmark to MAG to Loop to, I mean, it goes on and on. You're out there in the community, and, and you are working very closely on external that definitely affect the, we, the way we manage and grow the city. So we agree with that recommendation. 
Um, but one of the things along those lines that it also said it's time to consider a third deputy. If you take away those direct reports from the manager, and we'll have some organizational charts that we'll share with you that are proposed, but once you um, take some of those direct reports away, they have to report to someone. Uh, so Matrix was very specific. It says um, it recommends that we have a third deputy city manager. Um, so that's something that we agree with as well. Um, so that's kind of the high level, the two key things that, that we had pulled out of the, um, the matrix report and certainly can answer any questions or uh, receive input at this point before I get to the organizational charts. Can I make a suggestion on the first bullet for council and you, uh, Brian, that if, if that's what you're going to do, make those uh, alternatives. Uh, may I suggest that part of your team include uh, the chief of staff, the new IG, and previous incumbents uh, of the office, assistant to mayor and council. Uh, it was a lady Kelly Dalton and then uh, Susan Petty were in this position, and I think their viewpoint might be helpful. Any objection to that? Well, I, Mr. Mayor, I think there, there definitely has to be a definition of uh, responsibilities and where the, where the responsibility reports to. And, uh, yeah, very definitely has to be outlined. Pardon me? I think it definitely has to be outlined. Well, he's asking do you agree <laughs> with having those additional people interviewed or be part of this team, people that no longer work for us, is what he's saying. Oh, no, no. Yeah, that's the question he's asking. No. Why not? I didn't get it that way. May I ask why not? Well, these people are in, right now, are in different positions. And have them come back to report to anybody in the city. This should have been really relative to their exit form uh, that they, they give to human resources when they left. And if that information is there, then it can be garnered from those, those uh, exit uh, reports as I see it if they are privy to uh, the public and this council. Oh. Why would they be any different now than they would be when they first left? Pardon me? Why would they be any different now than they would be when they, if, if they left those in a report well, I, I, when they right. left? What difference does it make? Councilman, I believe that when they left here, the reason they left here was refreshed, uh, certainly fresh in their mind, okay, and to have them give information now a year and a half, two years later, uh, yeah, one of them is on board right now, is still on board, but, but uh, give that information. But those that have left and are permanently left, I don't, I don't think that they can give us any more information than they did other than their exit interview, and I'll stand on that. Yeah, they, they didn't do interviews, so. Well, we should have. They, well, if they, if they were employees, they should have given uh, In the environment in which the one left, there was no, <laughs> she feared an interview, frankly. Uh, but, okay, forget those two. How about the two that we have on board? Can they be part of the team? The IG and the chief of staff. Why do they have to be on the team? Because they know more about the job than anybody at this table or anyone out there other than them. But That's why. These people have enough. done it. Excuse me, explain that to me. These people have done this job. They've worked with all elements of the region. They have their counterparts and their colleagues throughout. You want uh, to compare with other cities, they already have that because they work with those other cities. And they know the problems and advantages of various organizational types. So if, in fact, you, and you don't want an independent, if you want the staff to do it, then all I'm saying is those people on our staff who are most knowledgeable of the function should be a part of the team that lays that makes recommendations regarding alternatives. Okay, I guess I guess I'm just going to have to come out and say what worries me. Okay, so I hope I don't offend you. But what worries me about that is basically since I've been here, or it's in my opinion, chief of staffs really haven't been working for us as council. They've been working for you. And, and so, yes, yeah, some of the things like universities, I mean, I'm not denying they don't do some things, but I just have difficulty in this because the chief of staff is your right-hand person, and that's the person you converse with daily. 
You tell her your opinions and your feelings, things that we never, ever get involved in. Or would I want to say to her, hey, what's the mayor thinking? Or what's, you know, I guess that's where my confusion comes in this. And so maybe I'm not right in this, but it's something I've wanted to discuss because this is, you know, it's like when we had this assistant, this council sort of used her as a sounding board and we went to her. When you're with somebody as much as a chief of staff is with the mayor, by the nature of the job, it's not a fault of anybody, it's just the nature of the job. You become very close to that person and their ideals and their wants. And that's, to me, I see the confusion how then that gets directed to the council as that's the way it should be. Does anybody get this feeling ever? I mean, I'm saying it probably not. No, you are, and I don't disagree with your point. Yeah. That's how you feel, I understand that, and I don't really have a problem with it. But I do think that the current chief of staff, because I work with her daily, I'm in there almost every day, she is devoted to the six people on my side. You may not know that, but she is. And what I was always looking for was how we can capture her ability and you could use it more effectively. That's why I wanted it independent with you in the first place. But, and now we've got, let me finish if I could. Now we have an IG who's particularly significant throughout the entire valley. They know her, she knows the job. It's, she needs to be accompanying you to GPEC and other things like that. That's how we need to use these people. And the chief of staff would be the one, as I interpret it, that did the tasking. That said, this is your functional area and this is your functional and I'll take this. No matter if it's something I do or you do. That's the way I thought it should work. I don't always disagree with you on that, but you're missing one point, and that's your schedule. It's pretty heavy. It's pretty heavy, and so that takes her into your schedule, and that does not leave her to be able to do what we did. But now we've got an IG, though. Now we have a permanent IG. We may fill the other billet. So the IG is probably going to be working with me on things that the chief of staff will not because she's going to step aside and do other things that the chief of staff should be doing for you. No, so there are, I'm sorry. So I truly believe that the chief of staff and the IG's opinions and thoughts should be recorded and should be part of the study. I don't believe they should be part of the team, though. I think that that still needs to lie with management. I do totally think we need to hear their input, but maybe not as part of the team. I think the team still needs to stay in the management section. Does that? But they are on the management section. Well. I mean, they report right now to the city manager, so. Brian and Jim, the two that are. However, but, you know, what this group is going to do is just give us alternatives, most of which we already know, I think. There's only certain ways you can man the office. But so anyway, we can do that. I just wanted to make, I'm just asking if we can include what we know as expertise on the functions and the responsibilities, if we can include that expertise in this team effort. Well, I suppose if you want to seek those people out and ask them their opinion and ask them to read a report to give to our team to take under consideration. That gets the information, their opinion of how it went, gets it to our team, and take a look at that. But the team should be people that are connected with the city, your team. Lori is his team. I know. I didn't say. I didn't say. I said the other, the other two past people that worked for you. Oh, you don't want, okay. I understand. I got that message loud and clear. Okay. They aren't in this. Okay. If that's, but are you saying the other two, the two that are on the, under Brian now can be incorporated within the study group? If that's, you think that's going to make that. Is that a problem? I would expect, I would expect the manager to include the key staff that would be included regardless. Yeah. And bounce the ideas. Ultimately, you're going to, you're coming back. I mean, Brian, you stood up and took these two major recommendations on, and the other DCMs took on their major recommendations because those were the areas of responsibility you felt you all were focused on and you had the expertise on and you had the experience in. Ultimately, you're coming back to us, or our permanent city manager 
once he or she is selected, is coming back to us with a final recommendation and I assume a slate of discussion options as you would in any other report. So that's what I anticipate. What happens, happens. I mean, it's, you know, it, I, I'd like to put that in. I'm making the assumption you're including your staff in these things. So that's, that's maybe too audacious an assumption, but. So are you answering, no, they, they, the, mayor, they, are you answering the mayor's question specifically, or what are you saying? I, mean, I, I don't understand think what you're saying. I, I think it's Brian. I mean, it's Brian's deal. It's Brian's responsibility in the current capacity that he sits in. But that said, value the people's opinions that are working in the role, that potentially have worked in the role in the past. Um, I, I think, you know, ultimately we have a discussion about what an IG does and what an IG doesn't do. We might have different, you know, different, different views on that, but. But that individual, regardless of who's in that seat, who's in the IG seat at the time, that individual's knowledge of the region and how things are structured around the region is of value, I would think. I, I don't I would, want any I wouldn't, information. I wouldn't think you're discounting I don't really want to hide anything out of this. I want their opinions. So, the chief staff has some strong feelings and some I things that it should be in the report. I mean, that's what this is all about. It's not to tell somebody, no, you can't give your opinion, but you can. It should be a fair and equitable presentation. Uh, Mr. Mayor um, and Council Member Lord, we, uh, I talked to the Chief of Staff this morning. We certainly uh, had intended to include her input in, in our, our assessment, if you will. Um, so that, that's already been started. Um, had not talked to the IG at this point about it. Um, but That should be a given. Pardon me? That should be a given. Well, that but, but we I just said, haven't talked about it is what I'm, I'm saying. I'm assuming if you're going outside to look at some other cities, that you will be talking to other chief of staff. They will be giving you opinions on how their offices are run and how effective or how they could be more effective. I just can't imagine we are going to skip that loop. Is that correct? Uh, we are not skipping that loop. Okay. This just confirming. So in a sense, we are going to get what the mayor is asking for. Yes. I, I, need to be, I mean, I need to be clear. Maybe I'm diving too much into this, but I don't see the IG as part of the structure of the Office of the Mayor Council. Interact with us, no doubt. But what the IG does has to have the endorsement, expressed endorsement of this body. And so I, if the IG is down at the Capitol representing us, they're representing the majority of council and what we've discussed, just like we have in years past in terms of a legislative agenda. So. I look at those as two very different functions in the city. I look at elected support very different than I do from policy issues, discussion here at this body, and carrying out the business and the will of, of the policy body is very, very different. And if we're getting into an arena that we're talking about the, the structure of office of mayor and council, we're talking about the, you know including IG in that structure of office of mayor and council, we have a far different debate than we do in terms of including their expertise and experience of working with the elected officials around the valley because they interact with elected officials on a daily basis around the valley on behalf of the city as a body, not as individuals up here. So I'm not sure I understood what you said, but I... I they report to management. Management carries out policy, and they carry out policy on behalf of the management of the city that we have set as a body. Which is what the chief of staff does. The chief of staff and the IG, because since I've, I've been doing this for four and a half years regionally, sometimes I'm not sure who's responsible to work with me. It's that close. Uh, they, they overlap, and that's one of the reasons I wanted us to look at this office to see if we could minimize that overlap. But they do very, oftentimes they do things that are very similar. In fact, they're at the same meetings periodically. Uh, they represent us all. They represent us in the regional arena, and they represent us with with the remainder of the staff. But uh, you know, I I, I, th I don't think we want to continue this discussion. But it uh, well, well, leaves a question. It opens a question. Maybe this, well, it's not are done. we getting anywhere with it though? But but the, but the question is, uh, are we going outside to look at other cities that have chief of staff? Are, are we looking at those to see how they function, and are we interviewing those people or those chiefs? I think Brian has yes. already done that. Yes, well, we're doing that. We're, 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 we're just process. gearing okay. up for it. But you that just has said, done, but not uh, the Councilman Sousa said we don't want to do that. No, he didn't say that. He didn't. No. That's not what he said. He specifically said he didn't want to interview one specific person who's in that position now. But no, no, 
No. It used to be here. He meant the people that are not, not no longer anymore. working for us. Well, I, I guess we are agreeing that uh, Brian will utilize the capability that exists in, in the IG and the chief of staff. That's correct? Yeah. yeah. Got that correction. Yes. But I do, I do, as long as you're doing this, I do want to be sure that the question is answered on, on uh, time, uh, timelines about how much time a chief of staff has to share that responsibility with all other council because it is a problem. No matter, and I know you're offering her up, and I really appreciate it. No, no that. I'm just saying she, she should she, run the office to help you, and yes. and she does that with other people or herself. But she doesn't have the capability now, right now, and that's that's because there there is confusion. Uh, but we can get through that. We can get through that. Yeah, I think we're getting clear off where we need to be in this. Pardon me? I think we're getting clear off. I thought I just said that about a minute ago when you kept talking. Uh, but <laughs> okay, Brian, you have the you you know what's going on, right? Yes. Everybody yes, happy? But, but, but you know okay. this is good because listen. So many times we have work sessions, and we treat them like, like our regular meetings. And this is what a work session. But I'm sorry, you all have to be out here to hear this. And it's too bad the papers say, well, why do they have to talk about those things and argue? But you know, this is what a work session. Because we sit up here, it's so formal. If we were facing each other, we'd be talking one on one like this. And so, in my view, this is good. This is called discussion, and you come to some kind of end result. Maybe not quite the end result you want. But we discuss it, and so it should be informal, and we should be able to set up talk off the cuff. I'm, I'm just no, you're, you're right. I, I think you're the press right likes it, however. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, their pens are down right now. <laughs> yeah. He gets it home, and he gets it. They home. ran out of paper. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor, members of the council, if I may be very specific, though, our, we will be doing the things that you talked about. We'll be involving those that, that we really want their input. Um, but it's two prongs. It's structure and it's effectiveness. So we're going to be coming back to you and asking what it is that you need in terms of service and those types of things. So I just want to make sure you know that we're going to ask your opinions um, because those are very valid as well um, as, as we finish our report. One last thing. When you look at population, keep in mind that even though our population may be 55,000, as our IG has stated, we think we are 100,000 at the growth that we have. So keep that in mind. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sometimes we think we're 500,000. Yes. We like, no, seriously, we like to act like, I mean, progressiveness is, is what we value. So absolutely. Absolutely. Um, if I may, I, I have good direction. Please. Boy, this is going to be hard for um, certainly those in the audience to read, but. Um, this is the organizational chart today, and you know what we, I don't think um, Elmo would help that out any, but essentially what you have is you have um, three direct um, employees of the mayor and council, and those are up on top. You can see the city attorney, the judge, and then certainly the um, city manager. And the current structure now is you have human resources, city clerk's office. Those items that are in yellow, those are... Uh, divisions, if you will, as opposed to full departments. Uh, but that's how, as we are today. Um, city manager has um, uh, economic development, human resources, city clerk, along with uh, you'll see the IG communications and the uh, office of the mayor and council. Then you'll see your two deputies, um, the span of control that they have, each um, four to five departments. Um, so that's what is today. We feel strongly that that needs to change, um, and we are the, the next organizational chart is going to get into what we're proposing, at least for now. And fundamentally, you know, Matrix says city manager, again, less direct reports. So what we've structured here uh, is to have intergovernmental relations, communications, office of the mayor and council. And then we're loading up the deputies, quite frankly. It's a very heavy load on them, and I'll, I'll be very candid. Uh, but but it, we are, each of those deputies, in addition to those departments, would also have um, uh, management assistance, uh, administrative assistance that they share, those types of things. So it is a heavy workload, but we kept it this way because there is a familiarity. For example, you see police on one side of the organization, fire on the other. Is that common in cities? No, it's not. 
Um, but we're used to working with them. When I go back in my role as a deputy, I'm used to working with Chief Brown. Um, I, I know where he hides things, so you know we have a good relationship going. Um, but uh, you know, seriously, we we feel like with that amount of workload that we're going to have direct reports, we really need to keep that familiarity in the departments that we have the experience with. So what you'll see there is um, our proposal um, for an organizational chart. What you'll see also on there, and I want to point out, is we need to quite frankly elevate our game as it relates to performance-based management. Strategic and performance-based management, you'll see that it's reporting to, uh, actually that's Jim Nichols' side of the ledger, if you will, and we're calling that an Office of uh, Strategic and Performance Management, Office of One at this point, but they will be working closely with the management assistants or the administrative assistants. They'll be working with point people in each department to now bring a lot of continuity, a lot of uniformity to the way that we measure success. And what gets measured gets done. We feel like we do things well, but we also feel like the most progressive cities spend time on, on these types of things. So that's one of the things that, that we would like to include in there. Um, and otherwise, it is a fairly general alignment to what we have now. Um, we're offloading the city clerk. We're offloading human resources. And then uh, economic development, I'd be getting that one back. The future org chart, and again, very clear that the next manager coming in may have a, a different way of doing things. But this is, this is what our, our recommendation is at this point. And what you'll see with a third deputy that Matrix recommends is we've now started to uh, align the organization, I, I think, in a, more, in, in a, in a way that, that would help support what we need. So you're looking at um, uh, three deputies, uh, and you'll notice that we put fire and police together. you also notice we had put community development um, back with engineering because there's a lot of um, continuity between those two. So we've been thoughtful as far as what we're looking at into the future. Um, and again, these, this isn't, um, uh, th this is what we're looking at for the future um, based on this current administration. I think that's good. Can I make a couple comments real briefly? Uh, one is the judicial branch. Uh, you know, we, our judge is now full time. Yes. And uh, it seems to me that he should have that branch under him. And he's responsible for that outfit, and uh, and he would report. Uh, he reports to the council, and I don't see why we would. Now that he's full time, nicely paid, here every day, it seems to me he should be running that outfit, uh, and that should be under the mayor and council, like as he is. And then the other thing is, Brian, uh, that's just for, to think about. And, and then the other thing is on that point. I, I do want to clarify that point. The judge is responsible um, for uh, the performance evaluations, those types of things, but we have the administ uh, um, administrative. Um, Jeff Fine, what's your title? Court administrator. Uh, court administrator, thank you. Uh, is that actually part of the management team that is there uh, working with us? It's, it's similar in some respects to the attorney, is also a, a council appointment that those employees are city employees. So you have to have that connection back to um, uh, the, the way that we're structured. But that's why we've dotted line. I mean, we have that now as a, um, uh, instead of saying the court administrator now re uh, does not report, but that function does in terms of being part of the management team. Seems to me Jeff should report to the judge. Jeff does report to the judge. And therefore the people there should be reporting to the judge. Um, through their chain, chain of command, but they are city employees, so they're governed by our, our policies uh, as regular city employees. Um, so as, a, as our charter is set up as all employees um, are actually under the, I'm going to say the guidance or, or the management of the city manager as a chief executive officer. Now that being said, um, yeah, they're, the reporting chains are there, um, but the charter um, has that otherwise. I just don't know that the judge would, wouldn't would appreciate the opportunity to have his own outfit reporting directly to him and him report 
take that organization up to the council. Uh, the and they're of, still city employees. Yeah. But the you, you, don't, staff. you don't have people reporting to a contract. I mean, those folks are, we have them on contract. How, how do we no, do the, the, the judge works for us. He's paid. He's got a contract like the city manager does, like the attorney does, with us. Right. Are the attorney's staff the stru same structure that Brian's talking about? I mean, you've got admin staff and attorneys and the sort. I mean, they report up to you, but they also have this dotted line relationship. They don't work for D.C. Young, though. He works for us. True. And his people work for him. That's all I'm saying with the judge. And they aren't working for the DCF. This is just to connect that body back to the management team. That's what that's for. It's not to oversee Jeff Fine. It's not. To you don't do it with the legal listen. department. Um, that's correct. But see, it. My point is, I just got it. Don't see why you do it. Yeah. Yes. You know, we have had a directive that was given to us by the chief of staff several, I think, about a month ago from the Superior Court that pretty much outlines what uh, jurisdiction the local judge has over its employees. And I think it was pretty much clarified in that, in that document the responsibilities that uh, the judge has to his employees. I'd like to review that and get back to you. And, and, uh, I just read that. You're right. Yeah. So, it it pretty, pretty much outlines the responsibilities of, of the judge and, and, and his employees. Uh, and it takes us the way I read it, it takes us totally out of the picture. Yeah, it's a separate branch, if you will. And, absolutely. And uh, the mayor is absolutely right on that. Yeah. And then the other point, Brian, is uh, in this report, we were criticized for uh, the two DCMs at that time having special duties, right? And you did. You had baseball and you had schools, and and uh, and that's the way it had to be then. And and you respond to that uh, point that Matrix made by saying you still want the capability of being able to do that. And I understand that. I appreciate that. But why don't you think about it? instead of having three DCMs, have two DCMs and have an assistant? city manager. This is the guy who's the <coughs> right hand man of the CM and also does these has these this bundle of things that the city manager is worried about. And when the CM is out of town, he's the guy that takes over. Why don't you think about that? So um, I appreciate the input and, and one of the things that quite frankly really want to work closely with the next city manager on this. You know, this is our response back as far as what is now. And the third de um, deputy city manager was a um, recommendation by Matrix. I know. I just ab absolutely. We want to work very closely on that, um, on, on those reporting relationships. Uh, so, appreciate that. And as it relates to special projects, um, uh, just for clarification for the rest, on special projects, there are occasions where you need an executive involved. And you span several departments, whether it be finance, legal, uh, planning, engineering, and you span that so you may have involvement, but it's not getting involved in the day-to-day -day details. It's helping out the initial structure, perhaps, of, of things and of negotiations, and beyond that, that role should be diminished. So uh, we're not looking at it on a daily basis by any stretch of imagination, but we know that those occurrences are going to happen. Okay. Um, now, this is a part that I think that will go um, <laughs> fairly smoothly. We are going to hit the departments, but pretty pretty quickly. Do we need a break or anything? I think anything? there's a desire to have a break. How about 740? Can we do that? Sure. I think it's 733, isn't it? Yeah, it is 733. 740? Sorry. Is that all right? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we've been, yeah. So everybody knows we've been at this since 330 today. So. <laughs>
30 seconds. I don't think I got too much more. Because we've covered the big items. You know? Yeah, no, I know that. Have you? Are you through your notepad? That's cool, man. Let's see over there. Oh, we first retired. How many days? Less than 60. Oh, okay. I had set a month, so it's actually... February 1st. Oh, February 1st. I thought you were taking... Okay, so you'd be there, Jamie. Yeah. We need to take a second. Not February. February 1st is January. We need to take you to lunch in January or something. Will you wear the Superman outfit? What do we do? Does any council member have any? I'm the conservative. Any objection? What do you think? Have Okay, let's go for it. Mr. Mayor, members of council, it's been a while. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> it's work session, yeah, we kind of had some, uh, certainly fun with this as well. What we're going to do is go <laughs> with the departments. What you're going to find is that you, you know, what's listed on there, we're not going to cover the agrees. Um, unless there's something we need to point out that includes a, a modification that will bring to your attention. Um, but we will focus on those that we would um, uh, disagree with and give the reasons why. Now, when I reach that point uh, where I don't feel comfortable in answering it, I will call up uh, upon the director of that department to go into any detail that you may need. So that's our game plan to get through the next 18 slides in each of the departments. Um, finding is an uh, overview of the city clerk. Nothing really to state there. Uh, community Development Department. The things that we um, disagree with, and uh, again, if you have any comments on the agree, just please speak up on the disagree. The temporary plan review um, staff. It's very hard to recruit, train, and retrain um, employees, and the turnover leads to inconsistencies. We absolutely disagree with that. The uh, return of first submittals, that leads to a decline in, in our customer service. We're going to focus our efforts rather on the pre-app meetings or the pre-application meetings, checklists, other things to really um, help on the front end of that to ensure quality submittals. And then the last one is just practically um, simultaneously notice of public hearings. It will cause delays, both with the PNZ Commission cause council delay, um, even though um, residents uh, would be in attendance. We think it's more of an inconvenience um, to the residents attending and hearing and or force PNZ to take action before they're ready. So that's what we are looking at for the Community Development Department. I'm going to keep moving on unless there's a comment. If anything um, hits you after the fact, please, um, please let me know. On community services, we've already talked about aquatics, recreation, and the community um, services. Question. So, yes, ma'am. Two questions, actually. Uh, First of all, and this can go across any department, really, you have a chart on here on page 39 that says on one-time costs of 14500 to to hire an um, administrative assistant and to hire management assistant. What are those one-time costs? Is what uh, what page slide? Page 39 in the book. Oh, in the book. All right, now on the slides. 
And I'm assuming that, that, like I said, this could be across any department rather than just community services. Not picking on you. Compu well, that's why I just want computers, desks, things like that, equipment, basic could, equipment. Can we have Elmo for just a second? Well, it's been a long time since I've oh wow got this figured out I don't know how well that's going to um, look but what you're referring to is this tentative budget that was put together for the Parks and Recreation Department so specific to your question um, I, I'm sorry what was that specific to my question <laughs> the, the one-time cost one -time that's cost? just what an average new office well, you know, what's included in what is that? That's yeah, computers, that's, that's what I was curious. Um, yes, especially on the administrative side, the office equipment, that type of stuff, it's very typical. Okay. Um, for every new hire that we have, you got to either outfit them sometimes with cars, with computers, office space, building cubicles, those types of things. Okay. And the other question, and this may pertain to IT, but under the, uh, the section um, regarding the web information, community services web information. This uh, discussed it was going to be 40000 to bring on a updated website, I guess. And I was just curious over time, and then 30000 every year to continue to update it. Do we look at tracking of our citizens using it? I mean, do we watch to see if it's justifiable to continue programs that way? That's why I said there may be an IT question. Connie, Mayor, Council, Member Osborne, the cost under community services was to bring on a outside program that would allow citizens to interact. They could um, file complaints, track the status of you know, potholes or sidewalk repairs. That was an independent outside program that we would have to pay to utilize every year because one of the recommendations was to bring our services, our computer services up so that citizens could use them. Um, ITS, when they look at new enterprise systems, will look at systems that might be able to do this without a standalone program. Well, to follow up on that, will we be then tracking the usage to make sure that we're just not putting... It's worthwhile. Yeah, that it's worthwhile, that citizens are really using it to justify having it. That's That was my question, really. What sites do track utilization of at least a, a place, how long they stay on the site, what type of activities that they do? If you could repeat that, just for the public, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, most um, websites do have some sort of tracking program, and they track how many hits or um, how many users actually log on, how long they've logged on, what services they use. Which is typical. I'm just asking that we're going to be, you know, looking at that ourselves and seeing that, yeah, this is worthwhile to our citizens to spend this money every year. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Economic development, uh, nothing else to report on that. Engineering. Moving the GIS program to ITS is one that we had have concern with, and the reason is, is uh, uh, currently the GIS serves the engineering department 75% of the time. The focus truly is building on the um, uh, base map data. So to move it to ITS uh, may be warranted in the future, but right now it would be, uh, with, we do not agree with that. The other thing is is to reclassify city engineer um, to a what we would call an assistant city engineer. Matrix recommended that. We disagree because that position is an official position um, that state statute requires and city code requires that the city has a city engineer. So that's, uh, that's just to stay in line with um, statutes. Okay. 
uh, finance. A couple of the things on there is uh, I do want to talk about we are planning on modifying the one. Uh, matrix says present financial statements to council on a monthly basis. Um, right now, our recommendation is to modify that monthly financial statement. Uh, excuse me. Uh, we currently prepare a quarterly report which identifies the major financial trends. We're absolutely willing to accommodate whatever it is the council uh, needs in terms of information, but we believe that's being met through quarterly reports. And uh, a significant time and effort goes into those reports. If we do that on a monthly basis, I, I, I think that would be a drain on resources. But that's the only other one we have there. Right. Yes. Right. Just on that one. In, your, in the document, you said disagree, not modify. In the, on page 72 of your document. That, uh, yeah. Yes, uh, Vice Mayor, that's correct. We initially disagreed with that, and then we said, well, we are doing that. We just don't want to do it monthly, so we came back to a modify. The PowerPoint presentation um, that's in front of you, um, you will see some changes as we had a chance to, um, you know, pour through this presentation. So we agree that the City Council needs financial statements, um, but just modify that and keep it as what we're doing now. In terms of how we vote on our accounts receivable, or is that different? Accounts receivable, those are monthly. And, and Larry, you want to go ahead and answer them, maybe some more questions? Yes, Mayor, um, Vice Mayor Antoniak. The, the reports that are specifically referred to are a report we're supposed to be giving you quarterly, and it's there's a significant analysis part that's done with it, and it's about a 10-page report. And, in fact, we haven't got you the first one this year, um, and it's because the, the person that does it did Want, looks for a whole lot of data before it comes in. To do that report monthly is extremely time consuming and that's what the concern is. We want to get you better f financial information on a more timely basis and we'll look at modifying reports. The monthly accounts payable report that you're giving is not what's being referred to. Is this, is the financial statements as Matrix identified as something that will come along with automation of going to our own enterprise system that you'll be able to build in in the sense that you'll be able to, you know, click a button and it'll run a re run your report for you at that point? Okay. We can, the report that we developed today, you would find no system that would because what it is is a report that's completely been catered to a lot of requests where someone says, okay, can you add this to the report? Can you add this? And it, it, it requires a lot of analysis. We can get you more generic information, and my suggestion is we give you more generic information, and as you request more information from us, let's build it again with that. Our system today, I think, will handle getting you more generic information more timely. So we're not disagreeing with the point at all. It's the specific report that was referred to is really where the disagreement was. I recall a conversation, this is maybe it's different, but I recall the conversation when we had this smaller group about going to finance and asking for a current balance on something, and that took days versus a few minutes. Do you recall that? having that conversation? I don't remember it in that. I remember the conversation. Was it in, was and it I don't know if it was in, this, in, that, in that context of your financial statements, to, you know, looking at account balance or something or, or fund, and, and rather than saying, Gosh, we're right around X million of dollars versus we're at five million one hundred twenty-five thousand seven eight hundred dollars and ninety-nine cents. Maybe I could uh, involve that. Doesn't link directly to okay. this question, but that is a very accurate statement. Project management under our existing system, and some of this is how the accounts are set up. Some is the computer system, but to know exactly where you are on a project in this system is very cumbersome. The user departments in public works and engineering and some of those find this system unworkable for, to meet their project management needs. And that, I think, might be what you referred to. And I will not disagree with that statement. So that's something that may come along with an enterprise. Absolutely. Want okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Satisfied. Thank you, Larry. On fire. Uh, just a couple of items to point out. One is is that we are looking at modifying where it talks about um, uh, assigning three officers to some apparatus.
quick comment is is that the um, with our current agreements and pop, uh, population concentrations uh, really mandates that we have four per apparatus. Now, as we start getting different apparatus in the future, can we look at two to three um, per that apparatus? Um, yes, we can. But at this point, uh, we would modify that to say um, uh, that we would could assign three firefighters to an apparatus, just not today. It would have to be something different than what we have now. If you have any specific questions, I can bring the fire chief up here. Um, the other item we do want to talk about as far as disagreeing is a commercial um, self-inspection program, and specifically the concerns there are um, there's no evidence of it working long term anywhere, and in fact it leads to serious problems in many communities. Um, so that is the recommendation of the fire department to disagree with that particular item. Wouldn't that also have an impact on insurance, fire insurance as well, right? I, I would think so. <coughs> Go on. Does it impact then, insurance as well? Mayor, Council Member Sousa, I'm not aware of the actual performance of fire inspections having an influence on inspection or, excuse me, on insurance rates. Um, in some instances, certain types of occupancies require, because of uh, regulatory requirements from other agencies, daycare centers and things of that nature, that we make a presence there. But uh, not not particularly aware of any specific types of requirements by insurance carriers requiring that they produce an inspection report. Well, then define self-inspection for me. Maybe, maybe I'm confused there. Yes, sir, self-inspection would uh, amount to we send a form letter to every business uh, that will not be inspected and uh, give them a checklist and tell them to okay. uh, check so, these things. And so if, if they're under understating their, their, their liabilities, then that's their fault, not ours. Uh, it it would tend to, I, I think that uh, we haven't really necessarily uh, evaluated it on terms of responsibility. Uh, I, I've been associated with uh, a little bit of uh, research on this topic. I can't find any place where uh, they note a decrease or a maintenance level of the occurrence of fires in these types of buildings where self-inspection occurs. And so it, from, from my perspective, it's an effectiveness issue. Um, and what we know is where we do fire prevention inspections, where actual inspectors arrive at businesses, uh, whether or not they're in uh, uh, fire apparatus, as is the case in our community, where our firefighters do a lion's share of those types of inspections, or whether they arrive in an inspector's car for a more specialized inspection, we know that where those communities provide that level of service, they have less of an, of an occurrence of fires in those types of occupancies. They have less of, an, of a disruption of revenue streams associated with those businesses operating in those communities. But let's assume that for there is self-inspection, okay, that there is chemicals involved in this. And we're not, the fire department is not appraised of these. And that, that puts, if there is a, an incident there, that puts them our fire uh, or fire, uh, firefighters at risk. That's that's exactly correct. Uh, typically, what you find is where you will uh, uh, see these types of self-inspection activities. A higher risk business would not fit the profile for that type. Uh, even still, um, with the data that we have access to doesn't indicate it's particularly effective. Thank you. Appreciate it. These guys are effective. I've been through. Is, is, is it correct, Chief, to say that that's what Phoenix is now pulling back in house? Isn't that, their, is, isn't that the current public dialogue that's going on with Phoenix on a, on a larger level that led to the 32nd Street and Broadway fire? That you know, I, it, and one of the fundamental things we do to protect citizens yeah. and our firefighters is inspect occupancies, and so so. Uh, uh, the, the idea that we would occur, we would uh, uh, provide for that level of, of protection for our citizens and our firefighters by sending a form letter. Um, statistically, we haven't seen that work, that actually play out.
human resources, uh, nothing really to place there. Can you modify or disagree? Um, ITS, this is one where I am going to call on our 60-day person, in, uh, <laughs> Kathy. And that is, is uh, just talk, uh, there are a couple slides in here that I, we've asked Kathy we to address. We more than one page. So, <laughs> on up, please. Mayor, member of, members of the council. I'm that. sorry? I said you might need the fire chief to put out fires after here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that did happen the first week I was here, I think. Um, <laughs> we've not disagreed, I think, according to uh, the documentation that's been presented so far. Um, the first topic is going to be, uh, or the first uh, item is to replace the ERP or HTE solution in this particular case. Um, as uh, Mark had pointed out earlier, uh, there will be a, a comprehensive business analysis that's done to determine uh, what the requirements are for the new solution. Uh, focusing primarily, I think in the beginning, we'll be focusing, as the matrix uh, suggests, on financial services and human, human resources. Uh, one alteration I would probably make in the recommendation for matrix is to keep our options open and potentially consider tier one solutions as well as tier two. Um, that gets into some granular details in terms of how comprehensive the solution might be. The reason I say that is because, uh, as Mark also pointed out, there's a number of departments that because of the uh, inadequacies in the current system are branching out and looking at best of breed software products that are uh, in a different, uh, programmed in a different method from uh, typical enterprise solutions. And back to uh, Vice Mayor Antoniak's uh, comments about reporting. That's where you see those challenges when you when you use multiple systems and you try to tie them in at the back end. You've got disparate data sets, and you're trying to collect information across multiple business units and present it in a usable, uh, uh, succinct, salient document. When you have those different business uh, applications in place, sometimes that's very difficult to do in the back end. Now, granted, the, one of the reasons behind that uh, recommendation is for cost. Um, and, and I propose that um, if we keep our options open, potentially that cost might be higher, but uh, for future iterations of software and potentially bringing those other business units back into an enterprise solution for, f for future consideration, you will have open options at that point. Whereas if you, you typically if you go with the type uh, tier two solution, you might be, uh, you might have sealed your fate at that point and may not be able to expand to include those other business functions. Um, obviously, we'll, uh, we'll do the, uh, an exhaustive RP solution for procurement and implementation of the new, new product. Um, the implementation would come out afterwards, obviously, after we've made a selection. Uh, development of long-term plan for maintenance and support. Typically, those are very cost, uh, costly items, so you want to make sure that you prepare for that um, and, and know what the circumstances will be as you go through the RFP process. Some of that can be dictated through the RFP process, where you actually include a particular number of years of maintenance and support so that your, uh, your ongoing operational costs uh, at least can be calculated uh, three to five years out. Um, and then, again, plan and budget for future iterations of the selected product. Typically, when you're looking at an enterprise solution, you're talking multiple millions of dollars to procure and implement. Um, what you find in some cases, not all, that some of the solutions do not include upgrade, complete uh, platform upgrades from version to version. You may get some minimal maintenance, but not the entire product. For instance, if there's a whole new, uh, a new service offering and another, uh, a new version, uh, while we may have paid for maintenance and some support, that may not be included in that maintenance and support. So those are things that you have to prepare for, and you can typically expose through the RFP process. Uh, considerations, uh, again, include uh, the integration and data sharing um, as we move forward with implementing the, this new solution. And how do we share the data? Again, uh, to my Vice Mayor Antoniak's comment about reporting. That's one of the bigger things that you notice. Um, in my experience, we're if you use the best of breed solutions and you have multiple uh, applications spread out across the, the organization, at some point there's always a tie back into financial services. And that's where you're going to face your challenges in terms of those quick reports and that information that you need dynamically. Um, that, that's going to introduce challenges where you may actually have to bring in staff to manually extract data from these disparate data sets and manipulate it again in a usable format. 
So again, a cost, uh, it could be cost prohibitive if you don't consider that in the future. Um, Jeff. Yes, sir. Somebody's telling me that setting the system up is one thing. Mm -hmm. But transferring information from one system to another is a very, very expensive and lengthy process. Uh, not necessarily. Those would be services that you would, you would again, uh, delineate through the RFP process. And in order for a, a company to respond with a, a viable solution for you, uh, they would need to know some information about your organization. So that's the type of information that would ex be exposed in the RFP process. And they would respond specifically to our data sets and, and, and uh, develop a plan for that migration. So that would be included. Okay. So, so now, in our deliberations with Matrix, Tier one is, is one method, right? One system. Mm -hmm. Tier two is another system. Correct. One is lower in cost, the other is higher in cost. It depends on, on long-term utilization. But yes, it, initially, um, it could be considered that. The reason I say that we keep our options open is because of the size of the organization. We are a little bit smaller, and typically organizations that implement large enterprise solutions like this are much larger. So the initial footprint is much more expensive. Since we are starting at a smaller footprint, uh, we may be able to get in very comparably in cost, but still leave our options open for future expansion. Does that make sense? Did that answer your question? Okay. Um, one of the other things for consideration, uh, again, is uh, expansion and being able to, to, in the future, maybe fold those uh, disparate applications back into the enterprise solution if it's, if it's merited, only if it's merited. Certainly you don't want to implement change for the sake of implementing change. Additional uh, considerations that um, were touched on briefly, again, by uh, Mark. Um, developing a comprehensive security um, plan and practices. In order to do that, it was identified that we need to add a, a position, and that's within the matrix report. And I agree, we all agree with that assessment. Um, one of the, the key points here is that as we move forward with developing a, a more resilient and uh, reliable infrastructure, uh, that you um, apply those security practices as you design it and not retro afterwards. So this was a, a very uh, a very good recommendation and I'm very pleased. Uh, another is to define and assign disaster recovery manager responsibilities. Again, these are, these are practices that you would want to do as you build out your infrastructure. You don't want to go back in and retro because then now your price tag has just increased significantly. It's also a harder sell. If you're developing, developing that insurance and implementing it as you build out your infrastructure, uh, the cost is, is much less. Um, reassemble the technology board of the steering committee. Um, and I was a little hesitant on, on using the word committee because the steering committee implies that we use formal business practices to make uh, very uh, granular project decisions. And we typically, uh, most city governments don't typically utilize, uh, and I'm not minimizing uh, this by any means, but um, in, uh, normal business practices to determine uh, whether or not you move forward with a project. For instance, a cost benefit <coughs> analysis, we may do that, but would be informal because we don't have that tangible, uh, that revenue driving our businesses. Um, so we'll move forward with what I would probably lean more towards uh, defining as a technology board. And what that does is as we continue to grow, we'll find that there are multiple competing projects for technology, all with very big price tags. What we'll do is have uh, the steering committee will, will be established of uh, departmental representation and executive sponsorship. Uh, ultimately, what this group would do then is, is look at these combination of technology projects, again, with very big price tags, and try to develop uh, prioritization based on the organizational needs and goals, not necessarily departmental. So it, it's, it, it's going to take, a, again, a mix of uh, departmental representation and executive sponsorship because what, what would, we would hope to have happen as we present these items for consideration to council for approval is that um, that that board carries weight and value and that their decisions are, are certainly considered as viable. Um, things that I think require further analysis that maybe weren't um, alluded to uh, very granularly in the matrix report is uh, operational readiness. And I think this is a common theme across this organization that I've heard in the 62 days that I've been here, <laughs> is uh, there's, some, there's some challenges that we face in terms of how our network is designed currently. 
and a lot of that relates to speed and robust uh, operations. In order to even begin to develop and implement some of the new uh, technologies that were recommended by the Matrix Solution, we obviously need to correct those issues. I'm not saying that we can't do them simultaneously. I'm just saying that these are things that definitely need to be considered. And again, that lends itself to the recommendation for uh, disaster recovery preparedness. Uh, development and alignment of departmental goals and objectives with the organization. I think that there's been um, uh, not necessarily abandonment, but at least um, there's been some challenges with IT's ability to communicate with the organization, and, and uh, there's been a lacking, uh, I think, of an advocate to drive some of those points home. And hopefully I've changed all that. <laughs> And I think the existing division of labor matrix suggests that the staffing is adequate for the for the uh, our department, and I would challenge that in that um, typically you'll find in most organizations or at least government organizations that I've come in, in, in encountered through the course of my career, there is a more adequate division of labor, and that is um, the technology industry has uh, disciplines similar to you would you would have as divisions in an engineering or uh, public works. Each of those divisions has a very targeted and very specific skill set. And I think one of the areas that we're, uh, we need to uh, thoroughly examine as we move forward with preparing uh, the operational readiness for the future is to consider uh, that we, we spend a little bit more time and, and focus a little bit more diligently on architectural design. Instead of being very reactive, then you've now become proactive because you've designed a solution that can take into the future that's uh, reliable, robust, and is expandable. And we're not in that position right now. And I th think that's all. I, that's all. That was all I had. Did, did anybody have any questions? The point I want to make is that you know what we got into with our current system. A lot of promises were made. Oh yeah, we can do that. We can do that. We can do that year or two years down the line, okay, we try to add on, well, we're in the process of developing that, mm -hmm. okay. We can't get into that situation anymore. I know you, you're, you're quite a professional person. How do you prevent against this? A co company saying that they can't do, but yet they can't in the long run. Uh, Council Member Sousa, that, that is uh, uh, what's termed in the industry as uh, vaporware. So uh, a lot of <laughs> that's the expression, but a lot of organizations um, have typically designed software to operate in, in a, a, a known entity. And um, when you solicit services like this, folks will come in and say, "Well, I'm close. I have about 80 percent of the items that you're asking for, and oh yeah, I'm working on the rest." Those are things that you'll have to very carefully uh, identify as uh, uh, graded options and weighted options in your RFP analysis, and you can certainly do that. Again, there's uh, in in the in my career in terms of uh, the RFP process, there is uh, certainly some times where certain things slip through the cracks. And uh, again, when you get down to that uh, final decision making point, I think the biggest thing is to bring people in and do a one-on-one -on -one and start talking with these folks and asking them very targeted question. And if they, if they're, again, you fall into that situation where it's vaporware and if they're working on it, then that's what you need to be uh, cautious. That's where you really need to be cautious because sometimes those things never come to fruition. And now, again, you've, you've paid for a solution under the premise that those options would be available in the future and they never get there. So certainly those are things that you would identify as we go through that needs analysis with each of the departments. Those were things that, that will rise to the surface. It, I can't live without this, and this one, it's okay. And those are things that, that will get identified through the RFP process. How strong can our contracts uh, be built to prohibit that? In other words, where we have recourse against the company that makes these statements and can't fulfill them. Is there anything that we can do? Um, I'm not familiar, uh, quite frankly, with the contracts that are in place here. Um, I know in my well, previous many, organization. Many in the future. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, typically what some of the vendors will like to do, and, and again, it depends on how City of Good here uh, operates in, in, uh, in terms of the contract negotiation. Sometimes um, you can use the contract that's initiated by the reseller, and I can defer to to Larry on that in terms of how uh, the procurement process works in that regard. Um, you can, that's a negotiation point that certainly c you can do whatever you like. And um, I, in, my, in my experience, we typically try to write our own contracts to avoid those, those pitfalls. Good, glad to hear that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions?
No, I just tell you, I think I'm feeling very secure with having her <laughs> at IT. And uh, Brian, thank you for hiring such an astute person in this field. Thank you. Appreciate having us. I do have one observation that was that was identified in the matrix report, and I don't I don't remember if it was in other departments, but as you labeled it, item number seven on page ninety four, it says establish service level agreements within city departments, and, and that's I mean I I we all work with IT, we all operate in an IT environment in our, at our employers, and, but that said, I I think that's something you could probably apply across the board to a variety of different departments within the city, is establishing kind of inter, inter department agreements with one another. You know, planning and zoning will, you know, because planning and zoning has got to shuffle things around to how many different departments for reviews. And I, I think you've kind of got an idea in your head, but to be able to come back to an agreement that you've said, you know what, um, and I'll pick on fire because they never get picked on, but, you know, fire has to get the review done and turned around within 48 hours or, or 72 hours, and then that way you can come back to that commitment and, and rise it, you know, kind of escalation ladders and that sort of thing. I, I think that's something that you could apply throughout the entire Service level agreement. Right. Uh, Vice Mayor Tony, Mayor, that, that, that was addressed by the matrix report, and that is uh, something that we actually kind of have uh, in practice right now. It's not very comprehensive, and hence going back to the departmental needs and aligning that with organizational needs and, and goals. And uh, certainly what would come out of that is um, a description of what IT services are for the organization and how we will uh, implement those services across the organization, what, what, a, what people can expect from the department. And, and that is termed as a service level agreement. I think other departments can look for that. Oh, well, at, mimic, we can all do that. that is, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But this, this is something that tangibly should be understood. I mean, as a BlackBerry user in the city, I'm going to use a blatant example to call up and say, you know what, we're going to get to that. No, past, past example. We're going to get to that in two weeks. Well, we're not communicating with you all out there. Getting, a, getting to a BlackBerry problem in two weeks is, you know, that kind of enters into that realm. It's not something that... But I should understand that throughout the entire organization. That was obviously a couple years ago. So. Um, yes, thanks for that recognition. Um, absolutely. And, you know, adding some formality to service level agreements certainly is an option as we as we look at a lot of the cross departmental actions. Um, do have a few, uh, for those in the audience that don't have a PowerPoint, we're, we're getting toward the end. Uh, but on the legal, the only thing that there's a disagreement with is the staffing levels. Uh, strongly feel that paralegal is uh, a paralegal is needed to allow the attorneys to focus on legal analysis and less on the clerical um, side of things. So that's one we do take issue with. If you have any questions of that, uh, Mr. Massey could certainly respond to that. Office of the City Manager, we've been. Excuse me. Uh, the only thing here that I would just um, add. <laughs> Excuse me. Is that we would like to modify um, establishing a management intern program in lieu of rotating the existing management assistants? Matrix said take one of the management assistants out of the deputy's office, assign it to community development. I will tell you, we would be dead without that support um, to, to really function properly. Uh, but we do see absolutely a role with management assistants in this organization. So we're looking at it in a couple of ways. One is, is we're looking at adding management assistance. We will be asking for two next year, one for community development, one for water resources. We will looking, uh, be looking at additional ones thereafter, perhaps a total of eight um, over a four-year period. Um, but keep in mind that the management assistants serve many, many roles um, for us. Um, and one of the things we're going to be adding to that is our uh, strategic and performance-based management side of things. Um, so. That's one where we are modifying by not taking one of our MAs and assigning to community development right now. We're looking at um, hiring interns um, through a, it's really a program where we, we have management assistant ones, twos, and threes. The twos would be in the deputy's office. Three would be in some of those special, more highly skilled areas where you don't want them to move around a lot. And then certainly the management uh, assistant ones would be more at the entry level side of things, using interns going nationwide to try and get talent. And we think we can start growing and those within the organization.
Office of the Mayor and Council, we've talked about some of the bigger issues there. There are none uh, that we need to address right now. Uh, police. The disagreement is, is uh, and, and certainly I'll go through these real quickly. If there are any questions, uh, the police chief can certainly address them. But disagree with the 10-hour 10, um, 10 versus 12-hour shifts. You know, this was tried in the past, and, and actually it hurt our recruitment and retention. Um, the officers don't like it. Um, it increases overtime costs, and it limits the flexibility of the training briefings um, during overlapping schedules. So that's one that uh, we absolutely disagree with. The, the other one is, is to redeploy from the night shift to the day shift. The disagreement for this is based on our best judgment concerning officer safety and beat coverage. The um, city is um, separated into five beats right now, and reducing officers would hurt our proactive and reactive um, policing and public safety matters. So that's one we respectfully disagree with as well. Public Works. Uh, this is just a modification uh, where trans it says transfer a project manager to engineering. Keep in mind we are looking at implementing um, and integrating CIP but it's still needed to have a project manager um, to support maintenance and rehab projects that don't rise to the level of a CIP. And project managers are very critical for those types of projects. So um, that is a mod modification um, as it relates, because we are transferring some, in fact, to engineering. Water resources. Sean Bradford's a very agreeable person. Um, doesn't look like there's disagreement with anything at this point. Um, for the public, that's our water resources director. And then lastly, um, just on next steps, we, we want to continue the dialogue. We very much appreciate the input we received tonight. And we want to update what we heard tonight. I'm going to step back for just a second. And I've, I've asked um, Lloyd Harrell, uh, one of our consultants with PW Consultants, to make sure we're on the same page when we walk out of here tonight for those things that we feel like we're going to be bringing you back in a COAC. Um, for next Monday that, that may be exceptions to our, our um, implementation plan. That being said, that does not reduce um, your ability to remove any others, but we feel like there's some, and we just want to hit those real quickly before we walk out of here. So with that, North. Brian, thank you, Mayor and members of the Council. Uh, as Brian said, this is kind of the starting place, things that we heard tonight that uh, ought to be withdrawn from the action that you will be asked to take next week, uh, but recognizing that there will be others that you may well add during the week after you've had time to more thoroughly review the report. Um, I would like to also, because I don't think it has been said and it needs to be, um, really uh, emphasize to you that both Paul and I did take place, did take part in all of the detailed management discussions that went on concerning all these recommendations. So, um, and I don't think there's any that we really take issue with. And I say that because, um, you know, we both have been city managers of multiple cities, seen these kind of things in operation, and at least uh, add that expertise to the various recommendations that uh, have come before you. So having said that, let me just review the things that we heard tonight, make sure that we're on the same wavelength. Uh, the first two concern reorganizations that are proposed and, um, and probably very rightfully so to wait for the new manager to weigh in on the uh, engineering public works merger, whether that is a good idea to have or not. And then secondly, uh, the idea of creating a standalone parks and recreation department uh, versus moving that to community services, the aquatics and the recreation. So both those items will be removed uh, for further discussion uh, as you go along uh, after the new manager has arrived. Uh, the next item, and you had plenty of discussion tonight about that, was the structure of the Office of the Mayor and Council. Uh, uh, Brian, I think, outlined to you the procedure that uh, he will be following to bring that item back at a later date for your decision, but it will kind of be removed from the matrix discussion. Um, 
The other thing we heard, uh, two items concerning the organizational charts. Uh, one was to remove for now, for further discussion, uh, the judicial branch liaison uh, depiction as it is in the organizational chart and uh, uh, bring back some discussion on the appropriateness of that placement versus having that directly placed under the uh, judicial branch. And uh, as the councilman said, that will allow you also to have time to, to review the various materials that you have received. Um, the other thing regarding uh, the organizational chart, and this is really in the future, so it's something that uh, I think all of us perceived as we were putting this together that the new manager uh, would weigh in on very uh, thoroughly, but that was this whole idea that the mayor advanced that uh, you know, maybe an assistant as opposed to uh, another deputy. And uh, certainly that uh, uh, will be looked upon by uh, the new manager, I'm sure, with discussion with you all. So those were the items that kind of jumped out. As I said, we consider that to be kind of a starting point. Maybe others that you want to remove during the week, and those certainly will be added as well. Any questions? <coughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lloyd. Um, and just to finish up again, December 10th, we'll be back for you next Monday. Uh, as a bullet point, absolutely, we will be reviewing with the city manager. And uh, the last point on that, we'll incorporate it into our, our this year's budget process, um, well, fiscal um, 08 09. And the last slide is just uh, a very quick summary, and that is, is again, the bulk of this, uh, this plan we, we did agree to. Um, absolute agreements, in some cases modifications, in some cases even deferrals, that it's something we want to do but achieve perhaps later. Um, so that we're, we're very pleased with the outcome. We just didn't know coming into this. The other is, is uh, we as staff and hopefully you as council too have, have seen the immense value that has looked at us organizational, organizationally wide. Um, so we, we think that it does look at the transparency of government. It opens us up and that's the right thing to do. Uh, and finally, it will serve as a blueprint to the future. This is not something that is going to sit on a shelf. Uh, we're going to come back to it. And it's something that we think, again, is going to be living and breathing. So with that, um, very much appreciate your patience and input tonight. And that uh, concludes staff's presentation. Uh, we'll have a chance to comment further when it comes to us next week, but I think we're sort of tired. <laughs> and we've been going since 3.30, and we got more than ahead of us. So why don't we roll? Okay. Let's get this over with. Okay. Uh,